Barbara, what's your last name? Pedersini. I'm sorry, it's a terrible surname. It's okay. You know what? I'm, I'm just going to have you say it <laughs> okay. because I could write it out, but I think I still. Now you know what? Um, uh, I think that when I started working with, uh, I, I was mostly doing destination weddings. Mm-hmm. Okay, and when I started working with people coming from abroad, I looked at my husband, whose surname is Franco, mm-hmm. and I said, "You know what?" I kind of wish we were in a country where I could change my name <laughs> because every time I have to say my name, I remember having to uh, book appointments at the dry bar in New York. Oh, yes. And trying to spell <gasps> my name for them. Oh, my goodness. And no, there was. Did it ever work out? Did they? No. Uh, did anyone ever spell it correctly? No. No. Absolutely. <laughs> but I didn't resent them. I mean, I, I knew it was an impossible task. Hey, if you're watching this on YouTube, then I have to issue an apology because I had everything set up to record my interview with myself and Barbara, and I forgot to push the record button on the video. Thankfully, not on the actual audio for the podcast. So you will hear that. You just won't see us, but we'll try and throw up a few pictures here and there, but at least you can listen to it. You'll hear me do an introduction here, and then later on, I'm going to kind of jump in really fast as well. So that's the story about today's episode. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening to the Heidi Ruscio podcast, a podcast where uh, where we feature female leaders, creators, and innovators, and we hear their compelling stories that inspire, hopefully inspire and encourage you as well. And today I'm talking with Barbara, as you could hear earlier, she said her last name so much more beautifully than I would have. So thank you for that, Barbara. And Barbara is a prop stylist. She does a lot of freelance work. She works for some big advertising companies, but she also does styling for a big interior design, one of the the biggest interior design magazines in Italy. And, um, but that's not where she started. She actually started as a stylist for fashion in Milan. That's right. She worked with all the fashion shows, all the big fashion designers, styling, and then her career took kind of an interesting turn because she ended up working at a bank and marketing. And then finally that led her back to prop styling. Her story is really um, fascinating and it has a lot of really helpful truths that can apply to our own lives. Whether you like prop styling or interior design or not, there are a lot of good nuggets that you're going to hear in here. Um, And I thought that it would be really helpful, especially for anyone that has felt like, you know, I have my hands in all these different um, things. Maybe it's just interest or hobbies or passions. And if you're wondering, how are these all going to fit together? Well, Barbara's story is going to really encourage you. So let's go ahead and hear from her. Tell me how you ended up getting into prop styling because you actually started styling something totally different. Exactly. I have to say that it would have to be, could you call it a calling maybe? Uh, I don't know. I mean, when I was in um, here in middle school, uh, you go to middle school in Italy in between the age of 11 and 13. Okay. And we had this um, technical design class and uh, one of the tasks that they have you do is actually draw up a plan for a home. So I was 11 and doing this homework really. And I got completely hooked. I loved it and I kept drawing, you know, maps and, you know, uh, homes and, you know, plans for renovating our grandmother house and stuff like that. And my mom, she's, uh, she, she was an art teacher and she was an artist and she had an interest in interiors as well. So that was always a part of who I was. And, but it was so much a part of who I was, of my interests that I never really thought it would become a job. Hmm. You know when something you like yes. so much that it's like, okay, it's... It's, it's just know. what I love to exactly. do. Exactly. Right. It's like I like the movies, so yeah. I go to the movies. Fine. So I like interiors, so I just uh, draw up... <laughs> <You> just draw <laughs> renovations. Yeah, exactly. At 11 years old. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And 
And so I never even considered doing that as a job. So I studied languages at university and I wanted to go into events, actually mm -hmm. planning, but, you know, corporate events and marketing. That was what I thought I wanted to My first job in Italy, um, after having an experience abroad, I did an MA at Warwick University in England. But when I came back to Italy, my first job was in a fashion company. And uh, as a side job, I did uh, production assistance at Milan Fashion Shows. Okay. So basically, I took holidays to go work 14 hours a day. Wow. <laughs> shows. And I always thought, okay, I'm going to build on that and that's yeah. going to be what I want to do. Did you have a lot of interest in fashion or was that something that you kind of stumbled upon? Well, no, I've always had an interest in, um, I would say, the art world, okay? Um, I usually prefer the entertainment, theater and movies and such, but I've always had an interest in fashion as an art form, you know, like a way to express yourself. Yes. I'm not crazy about brands, but I really love the idea of uh, really styling yourself to be more like yourself, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. No, it was really fun. It was really interesting. We, I was working at fashion shows for Blue Marine, for Max Mara, and for Borbonese, for Alessandra Ferretti and uh, John Richmond, and Moschino at times. And it was really, really interesting mm -hmm. because you saw all of this incredible work that goes on for months that mm -hmm. goes spent in a 10 minutes catwalk for Prada Porte. I mean, it's just, it's burned so easily. I think I have a very organized mind. So to me, it was always, uh, the fascination was always in really meshing together the art expression, mm -hmm. the creative side and making it work mm -hmm. in a practical way. Yeah, And I think that that's where I started understanding that I had an eye for styling. Mm. And so when I decided to go freelance and having my own events planning business, yeah. doing weddings, I, I really tried to keep the planning side of it balanced with the actually exploring the styling mm -hmm. side of it. So, um, especially with the photographer I was working with, she's called Paola Colleoni, and she's actually an amazing wedding photographer, mm -hmm. and she's doing work in the U.S. as well. I mean, she's really great. We, we just liked each other, and we said, shall we do passion projects? And yeah. so once a year, we set each other uh, a goal to create an inspirational shooting, an editorial shooting, uh, around a color. Oh. And we did blue. And so yes. it was an explosion of blue and we had a designer designing uh, bright indigo dresses and wow. we were at a lake and it was, and then one year we did white and we went to the Alps with the snow and we oh had actually a snowstorm. I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> But that way I had a way of actually controlling the styling aspect. Mm. That once, when you actually do a live event, especially a personal event like yeah. wedding, I found that it was better not to overstyle it mm -hmm. because I always thought it had to be an expression of the couple more yes. than my than your own artistic expression. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, but even then, for example, I always tried to ask my clients to bring uh, personal items mm -hmm. or stuff from their homes. And yeah. I always try to incorporate those into the styling of the wedding. Mm. So we had family pictures, uh, family heirlooms, or, you know, uh, sometimes we even had their table clothes used to set up maybe the cake table. Oh, awesome. Because I thought, you know, if you have to have a design that reflects you even here. It has meaning behind exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and so I had these passion projects with this uh, photographer to actually allow me to be in control of the yes. styling, <laughs> if you see what I mean. And, and so, and at the same time, I had a chance to... Can I ask you really yeah. quick, is there a place that we can go and see? Well, those? there is actually, because oh. I had a brand name uh, for my wedding business, which is Fata Madrina. Okay. I know it has to be. Spelled. It's okay. Listen, don't worry because we will. Um, I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. And I will, yes, I will give you the earl. Uh, basically, Fada Madrina in Italian uh -huh. means fairy godmother. 
So that was my brand name. Mm -hmm. And um, and I still have the website up and I still have some of my work there, both weddings and the editorials. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can see some of that okay. there. And cool. because I thought the website shouldn't be about the people because mm -hmm. I didn't want actually really to expose the privacy of my clients. Mm -hmm. All of the pictures there are basically about the styling of the wedding. So it's gotcha. all over there. Okay, great. Awesome. So while Barbara was living in Milan and doing fashion uh, styling, um, it was a little expensive to live in Milan. And so she decided to kind of produce or um, the events on the side, the fashion events on the side, and she wanted to get another job so that that way she could uh, afford some of the high rent. So she got a job at a bank in marketing, which yes, totally different. Then she met her husband, they had a daughter, and something that she thought was gonna be a temporary job actually turned into four years at the bank. So I asked her, at any time did that feel like that kind of stalled your career? In hindsight, I have a feeling that all of the choice that I made, even when they appeared to be based on just practicality and the spur of the moment, I, I have a feeling that all of it built up to what I have now and hopefully what I will have in 10 years time because, you know, yeah. we never settle. So That is so encouraging, especially for anyone that's listening that feels like, is this this time in my life or position in my life what I'm just going to be stuck doing or does it even have a purpose? Is this just kind of a stalling moment for me in my life? And, and so it's so encouraging to hear you say, no, looking back, it all led me to where I am now. There are two ingredients, I would say, to this outlook. Mm -hmm. One is that you have to be all in in what you do, whatever you do, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, like, ev even when I was doing this bank job, for me, it was an opportunity for, you know, I love theater, so it was like taking up a role and yeah. trying it to see if I liked it. Sure. And, you know, uh, when I was a kid... Uh, I told my mom that I wanted to become a career lawyer. <laughs> and, you know, the, my idea of a career lawyer, of course, was like, you know, um, Melanie Griffith in Working Girl. I mean, that was the idea, going to work in the big city, you know, the big yeah. corporate job and stuff like that. So I had that bit of an ethos. And when I had this experience uh, with the banking world, it was like, well, you know, you, you never know. I might even like it. Right. So let's try it. And because I had this outlook on it, I was able to learn a lot from it. Mm. And to this day, I know things about finance and how it works and how the system works mm -hmm. and how even that kind of corporate marketing works that I have been able to actually apply to clients that I meet uh, in my content creation yeah. jobs. So... That was the first, the first ingredient. And the second ingredient is, yes, you have to have an underlying purpose in life. But I think that that underlying purpose in life has, should have to do with being faithful to yourself rather than trying to chase, I don't know, uh, lofty goals, you know, per se. Right. Or I think that when you your main purpose in life is to be true to who you are and trying to find out who you are and enrich yourself, you're going to actually look at even failures or lack of success, not as a personal shortcoming, but as actually a means to an end, you know. Mm. It's uh, it's like when you fall and you maybe you know break leg or something. Yeah. It's not like you are entirely broken. Right. Something happened to a part of you and it's right. gonna heal. heal. Mm -hmm. And but if you know yourself and if you actually try to stay true to yourself, mm -hmm. this is just gonna be an experience. Mm -hmm. So I would say I sound much put together in philosophical speaking than I actually am. But, oh you know. my goodness. It, yeah. <laughs> but but you know, if, you, if I have to think about it, I would say that's it. I mean, it's not just, you know, cheap optimism. Mm -hmm. It's really a way to make things happen for you. Mm, yeah. And I have, I have a little um, eight-year-old uh, son and 
he says, oh, I'm so unlucky. <laughs> no, my life is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> because I also have yeah. uh, a teenage daughter. Okay. So he hears his, daughter, mm-hmm. his uh, sister saying, mm-hmm. oh, life is horrible because right. I'm a teenager. Right. So, and I looked at him and I said, you know what? There is... Um, there's a doctor who was actually Dr. Freud <laughs> <laughs> who says that uh, luck and mm. bad luck are actually what you put out there in the world. Mm. Because if you are looking for bad things happening to you, you will notice all of the bad things right. happening to you. Right. Whereas if you're looking at all of the positive outcome uh, of things and the potential, the opportunities mm. and so on, you are going to you're be going to see those. ready yeah. to grab them. Yes. So, yes, yeah. anticipating. Exactly. Mm. So, when you left the bank, then you went freelance and you but it wasn't fashion. You were doing prop styling and event managing or wedding planning. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And I was um doing well mostly destination weddings from, you know, people coming from abroad getting married in Italy and a few Italian couples going to get married abroad. I did a wedding in New York. I did a wedding in Santorini. Wow. Yeah, it was really fun. <gasps> and at the same time, I had met the uh, editor-in-chief of this uh-huh. interior magazine, and we had struck a friendship, and she liked what I did. And so I had a regular feature on the magazine. It was back in 2011, if I remember correctly. For a couple of years, I had a regular feature where I did a bit of talent spotting on the internet let's uh-huh. say so if i saw things that i liked i would you know link people so famous interior bloggers that were at the very beginning mm-hmm. and stuff like that uh social media wasn't that huge as it is now so it was a way of actually allowing even people who maybe hadn't gone on Mm -hmm. Facebook, yeah, to actually see stuff that was not on regular magazine yet. Mm. And at the same time, uh, they asked me to start doing some editorial work for them as well. So I did a wall feature on sort of do-yourself styling for Mm -hmm. your wedding, but uh, it was actually massive. We had an eight pages uh, issue all on it. And it was fantastic because we styled over two days and it was all color coded and I basically scouted all of the best DIY from Pinterest. Pinterest was at the very beginning back then and uh, all of that. And so, yeah, I realized that, like I said, something that I thought was just a passion project Mm -hmm. and something that I said, well, yeah, maybe I've applied it to weddings, Mm -hmm. but there was so much more that I could do. Mm. And and so that's where it started. You said something, and I wrote a note, and now I'm trying to remember my note. Um, artistic expression. What was that? What were we talking about? Okay. No, <laughs> this is what this, I always get in trouble with my <laughs> notes, because then I'm like, okay, Heidi, that, what, that, that, what does that even mean? <laughs> could it be that... It, uh, oh, I... I think I know. We were talking about artistic expression and, um, oh, I know. Okay. Okay. I got it now. Thank you. That's no, okay. <laughs> um, I talk for a living, as you can tell. <laughs> I don't remember for a living. So that's the part that, you know, yeah, I have an I issue totally with. I totally know what you mean. <laughs> but you were talking about how what's tough whenever you do these types of things like weddings is that you have to be able to try and, well, it's their artistic expression, the couples for a wedding. Even as a prop stylist, it's either the publication or if it's for a client, it's it's what they want and their desire. What have you found has worked for you to be able to discover that and then implement it? Okay, I would say that, first of all, very weirdly, Although I said that I liked to have my pet projects uh-huh. creatively side, uh, having limitations and boundaries mm. is actually what I find uh, more interesting about mm. creative expression. Meaning that I really like to be given a brief and to be uh, to actually have really boundaries within which I have to work. Mm. I would probably enjoy it less if I had entirely free reins. Right. 
That's the reason, for example, that those uh, color-coded features we did, there was actually, there were boundaries, creative right. boundaries. We didn't just say, oh, let's do, you know, the editorial of the month. No, it was like, let's, it has to be just this color, just so, just this the theme of water, and, mm-hmm. you know, all of right. that. I find it much more interesting and exciting. I also see that I apply this kind of attitude also to writing work that I do. Mm. I really like having to tweak my own voice to actually reflect the publication's voice. Mm. And although it's sometimes really difficult because especially when you're freelancing, maybe you're writing for like two, three different outlets. So you have to... Okay, I have to go detox <laughs> and then go yeah. back to the writing. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> you you really have to do that. Mm. And I think the reason is twofold. First of all, like I said, I really like boundaries mm. because I find them oddly free, mm. you know, freeing. And the other thing is the fact that I like theater. Mm. I like taking up roles. I like, mm. you know, trying a new outfit mm-hmm. and, you know, new shoes, not just for fashion, just even yeah. for like feeling like a different. That's that's our uh, that's other guest, exactly. Vivian. She just pops She's in the whenever host, she wants. Actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, like I said, it's um, I like the fact of taking up persona. Mm-hmm. And so whenever I am styling for a feature or yeah. a client, I did a shooting last week for a client I'm working with, uh, with an advertisement agency I'm collaborating with right now. And they are a marble uh, company. Mm-hmm. Working with surfaces is entirely different than working with props, mm. simply props, because you are actually reversing the aim of prop styling. Of because what is supposed to be highlighted. Exactly, because you're actually prop styling because you have to make the most of the surface, but the focus is is the surface. surface. And I found it so exciting Mm. because it it was something completely different because I had to focus on... I was working with another stylist uh, that I really love. She's called Elisabetta Viganò and she has a great sense of symmetry that I love in styling. And she is actually... I learned how to do la- uh, flat lace from her mm. because she was doing flat lace when Instagram was even, wasn't mm. even a thing. She was doing flat lace for magazines. Wow. And they use them as like mood boards at the beginning of editorials, mm. but she has just such a great eye for composition. I, we were working together, so and she was doing that, but at the same time, because I was working for the client, I would go in and tweak what she'd done to make sure that it, you know showcased the surface Uh so i think it's part of the yeah the acting side Mm -hmm. the theatrical side the fact that you have to really uh take up the client's goal and purposes and their vision and their uh their aesthetic Mm. and wear it for a day and maybe I wouldn't choose their stuff from my home. Right. But I try to approach the styling in a way that really, it's as if I said, okay, if I were their clients, <laughs> I would love to use this this way. Yes. And I probably this fascination with theater allows me to really believe myself when mm-hmm. I'm actually doing mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And... And also another part that I like about prop styling is editing. Because to me, prop styling is much more about the things I'm taking out of the frame than the things I'm putting into the frame. Yeah. I mean, uh, even when we are styling homes and uh, even when I'm, you know, just for funsy, (laughs) styling my own home to take pictures for Instagram and stuff like that, whatever I do is always, I do not assemble props and take up a corner and say, let's set up something. Mm -hmm. I go to a place and take out the stuff Hmm. that I don't want and then style what's left. And that's, um, I don't know, I think that's uh, the reason why Annette had the idea of having the style off that we're having next week in the workshop because it was like, it's a completely different approach for, you know, the the prop styling she's been used to doing. And... um, and, yeah, and I think it has to do with the fact that I, when I do that kind of styling work, I really try to, you know, impersonate the person that would live in that place. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's, f- 
far less about putting my style on it than trying to find what the true style of mm. what I'm trying to put together yeah. and making it shine. Mm. Do you think that that is a good lesson for anybody, even if they're not a prop stylist, even in your home, would you suggest the first thing to do is go around to every room and go take away what (laughs) what I don't like? (laughs) Absolutely. I'm a huge fan of decluttering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's possibly part of it. But also uh, I grew up in a house over cluttered, but Mm. over cluttered in a very artistic way, like, Mm, the walls in my parents' uh, home are like completely covered in um, posters and uh, paintings, mirrors and stuff. I've always loved the idea of going into a new place. I'm not the kind of person, and this possibly makes me very un-Italian, I'm not the kind of you know, one house for life person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. (laughs) I love moving. I love new homes. Mm. And I want them to be as difficult yeah. to work as possible because that's when the fun comes out. There's your boundaries again. Yes, Barbara, exactly. you're all about the boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, it's like, and and whenever we've uh, moved uh, or you know um, uh, found a new home, I've always yeah. been like, go in the empty space, mm-hmm. think how I would want it, put down the big features like the main features and then start building on top of it Mm. but every once in a while I take away stuff Mm. I'm not really I have friends who work in interiors and stuff and they're building their home to a goal you know yeah no so they may be buying stuff you know time at a time and adding it up and it's as if they have a final image in mind that they are building up towards I have an initial canvas and then I'm constantly taking out and putting in according of, um, you know, our routines or our needs, uh, our taste. And I do not have a final byproduct in mind. Absolutely not. Which is actually so good because I do, uh, usually I do have the final, but what happens is discontentment settles in so often because you walk in a room and you're like yeah but it's not where I want it yet so it just feels I know we did that with I mean with my house for so long there were some rooms I couldn't even go in because I'm like it's they're not, not there ready. they're not ready yeah. they're not finished so I actually like your <laughs> process a lot better <laughs> I have to be honest I've come to think that it's also a more realistic approach I mean yes. think about people yeah. we are never finished mm-hmm. as people I mean and if we are finished, quite frankly, that's a depressing thought. Right. Because if there is a time when you say, okay, I've arrived, I've yep. done what I had to do, I've developed, I'm, I've become the person I was meant to be, stop. And then yeah. you may be fo- in your 40s or in your 50s and like, what am I going to do with the rest right. of my life? Right. So I think it's a very healthy approach to life because it's actually uh, more realistic. We evolve constantly, even when we, you know, we grow older, we're actually changing habits, changing lives. The world around us evolves. Mm. Us. So to have a final goal is setting us up for failure yeah, in a way. Is. Because yeah. there is no way that you're going to get to a point and that's going to be exactly like you envisioned. Mm-hmm. So I would say is very much about managing expectations, mm-hmm. but also keeping, again, your options open to be, to change your mind. Yes. Like, you know, I love the color blue. Yeah. I mean, literally, my bag, <laughs> it was it became my trademark color. Mm. My friends and family call it Barbara Blue <laughs> when I was 18. That's awesome. So I have, I, I love this color. It was my uh, wedding planning brand color to mm. the point that I went to a wedding two weeks ago and a photographer came up and the photographer came up to me and we had met, I think, 10 years ago or something. And she came up to me and she said, you are Fata Madrina. And I was like, yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, that's me. And I'm like, oh my God, you were amazing. I'm so sorry you're no longer planning and stuff. And I, I, com- I immediately recognized you because you are always dressed in blue. And I was, of <laughs> course, dressed in my trademark blue. But even though I, I have a color, I would never say, okay, I'm going to have all of my living room around Mm. blue 
We do have a lot of blue, to be honest. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's because it's such a great I, color. It I is mean. a great... I have to agree with you. I do love blue. So, I, yeah, I think that uh, having, you know, as a metaphor for life as well, mm-hmm. having a rough map of what you like mm-hmm. and of your where your passions lie and what really fires you up mm-hmm. and then work with it yeah you know adapting it mm-hmm. to how things go and how you you maybe find out something new or you change or yeah. even your circumstances like having children and even having a husband i mean i have friends who i love them they're great <coughs> they're great girls amazing impeccable taste but they basically uh, styled their homes by themselves because their husbands aren't really bothered right and they never involve them and whenever i go to their homes i'm like it's her home not it's not your home the exactly both of them. Mm-hmm. and so sometimes i hate parts of my home because my husband has very strong opinions and very mm. poor taste in interiors i'm yeah. afraid <laughs> <coughs> but same <laughs> you know what I mean. I know what you mean. Yes. Like he's crazy about a- the eighties, yeah, yeah. and I say no more. <laughs> so yeah, I had to compromise, and sometimes it's painful. Yes, <laughs> but also at the same time, I've learned to boundaries mm-hmm. to love working with it, and to say, okay, if we are not both entirely on board with this, we're not going through with this design Mm -hmm. or with this uh, piece of furniture and everything. And that way our home is far from perfect, (laughs) far from photo shoot ready, but still it's so us and it's so comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so, so yes, I mean, I think you have to be open to uh, the good that comes out from sometimes the discomfort maybe of Mm -hmm. change, but uh, eventually it's, uh, I think it's much better, more exciting anyway. I think so too. I, and I really cannot think of a better way to end our talk too. I don't want to end our talk. We'll keep talking, but, (laughs) um, (laughs) but I just think that what a great way to close that out Thank because you. it feels like that has been a reflection in your life and in your job and a great lesson for us all to learn. Oh, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you for having me. It was really exciting. Great. And listen, you can learn from Barbara too. I don't, I guess actually this won't come, this will come out after you've already done the workshop, but Barbara is going to be an instructor at Annette's styling workshop um, here in Italy, but hopefully she'll be back. So you'll yeah, have a chance absolutely. to I mean, um, learn from her. I have to say that, I mean, we clicked very well, Annette and I, so mm-hmm. I definitely think this is not going to be our last project together. Yeah. So yeah, there will be other options. Great. And then I will list in the show notes how people can follow you Absolutely. and follow along. Um, and her Instagram account is just beautiful. Thank you very so much. There's blue. Yes, there's a lot of blue. There will but be blue. as well. And red. <laughs> <laughs>